Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Nikolai, and I'm a developer technology engineering manager at NVIDIA. Uh, my team works on optimi optimization of uh, applications for NVIDIA platform. And then with me today, Jason uh, Lau, who is a systems uh, software engineer at NVIDIA, and he works on uh, Rapids Accelerator for Spark. So today we'll talk about ETL processing on CPUs versus GPUs. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess the clicker doesn't work, working. but let's just go with the standard. Yeah, there you go. All right. So uh, GPUs are well known for their acceleration capabilities for deep learning training and inference, uh, but can they really be used and, and benefit the pre-processing uh, and ETL? So that's the question that we're gonna try to answer today in our talk. And uh, we'll go over uh, some typical performance limiters for database operations, how these uh, database operations map to both CPU and GPU hardware. And then um, what are the different benchmarks? We can show you uh, micro benchmarks and also full SQL query performance. And then Jason is gonna talk about Rapid's uh, uh, accelerator for Spark, show some more benchmarks and some cost efficiency numbers as well. Oh, thank you, Jason. Uh, so let's look at a join. So join is a very common bottleneck in uh, database processing. Uh, and I'll focus on the one particular implementation of join called uh, hash join. So in a hash join, you have two phases, a build and a probe phase. Uh, in a build phase, you go scan your table. For each entry, you compute your hash value, and then you go do an insertion into the hash table. So that's typically, if you, all, all, you wanna do this all concurrently for all the rows, you need to use atomics for that. And then uh, for the probe, you do very similar. You go look at another table, you go through all the rows, compute the hash value, and then do a random read into the hash table. So I'm omitting some details here, how to handle hash collisions and some other things. Uh, but at a high level, you can see that uh, you need to scan both tables. So you have sequential reads and writes, uh, writes for the output. And then you also need to do a random access to the hash table. So these are the common memory operations that you do for a join. And these are, could be your performance limiters, depending on the architecture. Um, and then obviously also computing the hashes, right? So that could be also a limiter based on what architecture you use. Um, next slide, thank you. So now let's look at the CPU and GPU architecture. So on the left, I have a CPU, a modern CPU architecture with a few dozen cores, and uh, they all uh, have, you know, there's a L, L, uh, like a cache hierarchy that also goes to the DRAM, which is typically a DZR memory. And then on the right, I have uh, a GPU architecture, a diagram for a GPU architecture, which has 100, uh, about 100 of SMs. Uh, we call them streaming multiprocessors. They all interconnected through. They all connected through a crossbar to L2 and then to the high bandwidth memory. And now the biggest difference between CPU and GPU is that on the GPU each SM can actually do many operations at the same time. So for example, on a Hopper GPU, uh, it can do uh, if we're computing integer uh, right hash functions and everything, it can do about a 64 integer operations per clock each each of these SM units. So. The biggest difference is that you have a lot more parallel computing you could do on the GPU versus on the CPU. And that's also how can we actually uh, saturate our high bandwidth memories because you need to have a lot of load in flight uh, to get the high, high bandwidth memory achieve that. And then the CPU is, or, sorry, the GPU is connected uh, over the PCIe bus to the CPU memory as well. So you can access it that way. So next slide. Now, um, so let's, let's now try to map the uh, join to uh, both CPU and GPU architecture. Look at the performance limiters. So first we look at the CPU. And here I chose a, a modern uh, Intel Sapphire Rapids uh, CPU with eight DDR channels uh, with about uh, 300 gigabytes per second peak uh, memory bandwidth. So that's the speed at which you read the tables and write the tables, right? And then accessing the hash table, which is a usually a eight byte random reads or atomics that you can do with about 24 gigabytes per second peak kind of performance. So that's gonna be your limiter actually for the CPU when you implement a hash join with a relatively large hash table that doesn't fit in caches. Now, if we look at the GPU and try to map the join algorithm to the GPU, um, so the, the input tables, you still try to access from system memory, right? And so you have to go through the PCIe bus. And so that's gonna be a limiter for the uh, performance, you know, for reading the input tables. And that's gonna be about 64 gigabytes per second in each direction, right? And then accessing the hash table though, uh, you can do at about 300 gigabytes per second. So that's gonna be a lot faster. 
Now, if you look at these two bottlenecks, right? So on the GPU, we're limited by 64 gigabytes per second. On the CPU, we're limited by 24. So we're about like two, three times faster, right? So it's not a, not a great speed up. It's still, you know, some speed up, but not a great one. So next slide. So this is why we designed a new chip, uh, which is called a Grace Hopper Super Chip. So it's a tightly coupled uh, ARM CPU, uh, Grace, uh, with a GPU Hopper. And they have a, an interconnect C2C that has about 900 gigabytes per second bidirectional bandwidth. And so that means is your you know, speed at which you read the data is now 450 gigabytes per second. And your PCIe bottleneck goes completely you know, away. Um, and so in this case, on the, if you run the join on this system, you're actually going to be limited by the uh, random access to the hash table. Similarly, how the CPU is limited by the same. Um, so now let's look at the micro benchmarks. So um, I explained. So the next slide, thank you. Uh, so I explained kind of the limiters and what we should what we should see on this performance. Uh, and this we actually implemented a join on Grace Hopper, and uh, I'm showing here a micro benchmark. Um, the uh, green bars here is the Grace Hopper performance for build and for probe. And then the other two bars are CPU only uh, performance of join. Um, and these are projections, right? So I just took the peak numbers for CPU, for Sapphire Rapids and for Grace and just projected what the best performance could look like, right? And so we can see the achieved performance on the GPU, uh, your Grace Hopper architecture is actually an order of magnitude faster than the peak possible projected performance for the CPU. And it, uh, you know, it's the same for build and for the probe phases. Now, a micro benchmark is, is great, but uh, what customers are looking for is usually you know, performance of the uh, you know, hardware across many different queries, right? And they all can have different limiters. So for that, we actually uh, looked at uh, another benchmark. Uh, next slide. Um, so we use an NVIDIA Decision Support H benchmark, which is uh, uh, derived from a TPC H benchmark, and it uses the same 22 queries and the same scaling factor to control the input size. Uh, next slide. Um, and so here I have a, a performance numbers. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the queries because they are hidden by the subtitles, but these are all 22 queries from the benchmark, and I have uh, Grace Hopper performance in green, and these are the timings in seconds. Um, so the Grace Hopper performance is from our prototype uh, that we implemented on top of Rapid QDF. And then the blue number is a CPU, a commercial CPU in memory database uh, results that we also captured for the same uh, setup. Um, and if you look at the numbers here, you can see that if the very first query, query one, for example, doesn't see a lot of speed up, right? So the GPU is only slightly better. And that's actually expected because this query and query one and query six, they don't have any join. So it's a very simple aggregation query that only reads the data. And, uh, and so in this case, your advantage of Grace and Hopper over the CPU is not that significant. So only 450 gigabytes per second over the 300 gigabytes per second, right? So it's slightly more. But some other queries like query 18, for example, and query nine, they see a lot more performance benefit because these are the complex query that have joins, right? And so you have to do a lot of this hash table lookups and insertions. And overall, we see that the performance on the, uh, across the whole benchmark uh, in, you know, the, some of the queries are up to 15 times faster on the GPU than on the CPU. This is for the end-to-end -end SQL query performance. So the, it's apples to apples. So the data starts in CPU memory, right? And we run it either on the CPU or we run the whole you know, query on the GPU. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is just demonstrates what's possible to implement right in a in a database engine right when you try to use GPU acceleration and build it on top of Rapid QDF. And uh, these are the preliminary results. So we're still working on some more optimizations, more improvements, but it already showcases that GPUs can can show really good performance uh, against the CPU. And with that, I want to turn it to Jason, who is going to talk about uh, partial Spark and Rapids. All right. So uh, traditionally, Spark has been able to schedule for GPUs, but not actually use them directly. So Spark would schedule a GPU for an executor, but then when the executor ran, it was up to the application's specific logic to actually use the GPU. Spark itself wouldn't use the GPU, it would just schedule it. And so NVIDIA provides two different solutions for having Spark itself accelerate with GPUs. We're gonna talk about one of those today was the Rapid Accelerator for Apache Spark on the left, which will accelerate SQL data frame APIs. And then the one on the right, which we won't talk about today, but I'll just mention is uh, Rapid Accelerator for Apache Spark ML, which will accelerate applications using Spark's ML lib 
and sort of a seamless way to accelerate applications using MLlib. Both of those are built on top of Rapids. Rapids is a suite of libraries, open source. By the way, both of these projects, Rapids Accelerator, Apache Spark, and ML are open source. Rapids is open source. Rapids is a suite of libraries designed for high-speed processing, data processing on, with GPUs. And of course, Rapids is built on top of CUDA, which runs on NVIDIA GPUs. So Rapids Accelerator for Apache Spark, what is it? It's a plugin for Spark that lets you accelerate SQL and data frame APIs without any query code changes to your application. So you don't have to use weird data types, weird custom magic UDFs, weird decorators. It's the same query code you had before. You just have to drop a single jar in the class path, configure the plugin, and then it's the same code, same data frame code, and anything that's built on top of those APIs, like PySpark, Spark R, and those things. And the reason we're able to accomplish that is because if there's something we cannot do on the GPU, we will seamlessly fall back to the CPU and execute the original operation on the CPU. And we'll cover in detail how that works. So as you may or may not know, when Spark goes to execute SQL or data frame APIs, it builds a logical plan. And then that logical plan goes through Catalyst. Catalyst is Spark's SQL optimizer. Catalyst will do a series of optimizations on that logical plan, build a physical plan. That physical plan will then execute on the CPU, row by row, serially for each task, using a sequence of RDDs of internal row. So what the Rapids Accelerator does is it plugs into Catalyst relatively late in that process, and it will intercept nodes in the physical plan that we can operate on the GPU and accelerate. So joins, hash aggregates, parquet reads, parquet writes, filters, you know, pretty much all the standard stuff you've seen before. And those execute as RDDs of columnar batch. So we're not doing serial processing. We're doing parallel processing of many thousands of rows at the same time. Because again, that's the power of the GPU, right? And the time it takes us to compute one of the rows, we've computed thousands of rows. And that's where you get the really the speed, the speed up from the GPU. Again, going into benchmarks, this is specifically with the Rapids Accelerator. This is, again, drop-in plugin for Spark. This is with NDS, which is our TPC-DS-derived benchmark. TPC-DS is a very famous benchmark in the Spark community. It's what's traditionally used to benchmark Spark. Uh, it's the exact same queries as TPC-DS. We did not modify the queries. It was some execution scripts that were modified. It, therefore, it's not technically TPC-DS, but in the sake of full transparency, there's a URL at the bottom. This is all open source on GitHub, what our benchmark is. If you want to replicate NDS, the code is there. You can replicate these benchmarks. So the first benchmark was run on AWS EC2. This was Spark, Apache Spark 3.4.1 using Parquet data scale factor 3K, which is the three terabyte data scale factor, and the data was stored in S3. So we've got on the left, we've got eight CPU nodes using R6ID 8X large. On the right, G6 nodes. And you can see the details there. That's partially obscured by the captions, I apologize, of the stats on those nodes and their costs. And notably, the G6 nodes have a single L4 NVIDIA GPU on each node. So there's eight GPUs to leverage for this cluster. Again, sake of full transparency, these are the configurations for both the CPU and GPU that we used. Notable changes here is uh, there's a file cache that we provide in the Raps Accelerator. We turn that on for this. There is uh, a larger max partition bytes we use for the GPU. Why would we do that? That's because, again, we want to give a lot of data to the GPU. The GPU gets opportunities for parallelism with more data. More data, bigger speed ups. So we use a larger partition size for max partition bytes. We have a custom shuffle manager because, again, since the data is being primarily processed on the GPU, the CPUs are relatively idle. We leverage that idle CPU time in our shuffle manager to accelerate the shuffle itself. And then uh, we also use pin memory to accelerate the data transfers between the CPU and the GPU. These are the results of that. And again, a lot of people think, OK, GPUs can make my stuff go faster, but I'm going to have to pay for that. And it is. It does make it go faster, right? So this is like 5.8 times faster for this workload. This was, again, this was no, we did not run an analyze command or a pre-cache. We didn't preload the data in any way. This was cold data sitting in S3, and we ran the queries. There were no stats that were built up to make it run faster in one case or the other. So it's about 5.8 times faster. But again, it's a lot cheaper, 85% reduction in cost. And that's, again, showing that you can, you can use GPUs if you want to save cost and you don't want to go faster, you can still save cost. Because a lot of people in ETL, they're really cost sensitive. And GPUs, despite them having sort of a price associated with them, you can actually get cost savings with GPUs with ETL. We also did a benchmark with Gluten and Velox, which is a uh, native vectorized engine that's open source available for Spark. 
This was run on our NVIDIA EGX servers. This was an eight node server. Uh, you can see the stats of that here. And we basically ran it, same machine, same cluster, either using the GPU or not. So that was the comparison done here. Again, these are the configs that we used. For reference, everyone wants to take a screenshot. I'm not gonna spend too long on this one. All right. And then these were the results. And so the GPU was approximately about three times faster wall clock time. And this is a breakdown of like the top five queries. We weren't faster on every single query. The overall we were, right? But like there are some queries were a little bit slower. Some we were significantly faster. For example, query 67, can't quite see it there. The one where we got the almost 12 times speed up, that was a windowing query. Large windows tended to funnel the data just a few tasks. And we were able to use the power of the GPU to basically just brute force that window algorithm. It gets lots of parallelism opportunities, goes really fast there. So we get some significant speed ups. So going back to what Nikolai talked about, uh, Grace Hopper, we also benchmarked on Grace Hopper at GH200. This was a 10 node cluster. We got stats on the cluster, Grace 72 cores, H100, super high speed NVLink coherent uh, interconnect there. Again, here's the configurations we used for that. Uh, one of the things you might notice, we used relatively small amount of executor memory, and that's because we arguably should have on the other ones as well. It's because the data is not being processed in the JVM heap like it traditionally is. It's being processed in GPU memory. So even though we're doing relatively large scales here, we don't have to bear the brunt of those large scales in the heap like is traditionally done with Spark. And these were the results on Grace Hopper. So what we did here is we benchmarked it. You can't quite see it at the bottom. We, we basically swept a long scale. So we started with the left with three terabytes. Three terabytes executed in 3.7 minutes on this 10 node cluster. We then did 10 terabytes, 30 terabytes, and 100 terabytes on the same 10 node cluster with the same configs. And so you can see here that we're doing 100 terabytes in a 10 node cluster in about 50 minutes. And over here you can see the scaling trends. So again, normalizing the scale for three terabytes and scaling up there. See, as we add 10 times the amount of the data, we're doing about five times the amount of time. We do 33 times the amount of data, it's just under 14 times the amount of time. And so you get this sort of sublinear scaling effect. So, and that is just about all the time we have for a lightning talk. The, so I wish we'd tell you a lot more, but a lightning talk's all we have for the format. But what I want to do is make sure you take away just a, kind of a key thing here is that a lot of people don't realize that you can use GPUs for ETL. They're like, okay, GPUs are amazing for machine learning. And that is true. But they're thinking, well, ETL, it's not fixed with data. It's not matrix multiplication. So, you know, it's, it's variable size. It's messy, it's like CSV or JSON or Parquet. It's, it's not going to be good for that. And, you know, as Nikolai talked about with joins, there's sort of inherent architectural advantages we have when doing things like hash joins. And we can handle things like variable size strings, structs, maps, arrays. Those are all being done with this accelerator. And so the main takeaway for here is to make sure you understand that you can use GPUs for ETL and it can be cost savings. It's not just, I want to go faster no matter what the cost. I'm all about cost savings. You can achieve those cost savings with GPUs. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming. If you have any questions, Nick and I will be there. in the back and we'd be happy to take any questions in the back. Thank you for coming.